Welcome back to Building Tomorrow, a show dedicated to the ways tech and innovation are making the world happier, freer, and more prosperous. This week, I have two more interviews for you from the Lincoln Network's Reboot American Innovation Conference. Both involve an element of predicting how systems that we currently take for granted, in this case, the cities we live in, the car insurance that we all buy but hope to never have to use, how those systems will evolve in the future. First up is Dr. Mark Lutter, who I chatted with about charter cities, what China is doing right in the Shenzhen Tech Hub, and the prospects of a charter city currently taking shape in Zambia, Africa. I'm here with Dr. Mark Lutter, Executive Director of the Center for Innovative Governance Research. Uh, Thank you for coming on the, the podcast. Thanks for having me. So let's start real basic. What is a charter city? So a charter city is a new city development that has a special jurisdiction, which allows it to adopt the best practices in commercial law. Okay. And broadly, what this means is we look at some of the success stories since World War II, Singapore, Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Dubai. These are all cities that have some level of autonomy in commercial law that have allowed them to adopt uh, systems which allowed them to become world-class cities in two or three generations, lifting tens of millions of people out of poverty. And we believe this model is replicable throughout um, emerging markets to help house the rapidly urbanizing population. There's about 70 million new urban residents um, every month. And to house these new urban residents as well as create a policy framework that allows them to achieve their potential instead of just living their lives in slums. I was just uh, the other day I watched, uh, was it Crazy Rich Asians? Yeah. Um, So, which is fascinating as someone who's not familiar with Singapore, I'm sure it's depiction of Singapore is only partially accurate. But I then went and Googled the growth trend per capita GDP in Singapore. It's It's a crazy, you know, 50 years ago, they're significantly poorer than, say, the U.S. In not just the U.S., they were poorer than a lot of parts of Africa. Yeah. Singapore's per capita GDP in 1960, according to the World Bank, is under $600 a year. Wow. Now it's 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 higher sixty thousand yeah, sixty. That's crazy, crazy amount of growth. To what extent is this a function of like decolonization? So like Singapore, I don't know if that fits Dubai quite as well. Maybe British influence pulling out of the Middle East. So you have all these like cities with decolonization happening in the nineteen fifties and sixties. They now have a level of freedom that they didn't have under a colonial regime or what, what's no, going on there? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't point to that. Uh, Hong Kong, for example, remained a British colony and they were quite successful. So obviously colonization is bad, but when we think about what leads to economic growth, the question is, what is the, do they have a good legal framework? And there are several mm-hmm. other important aspects. For example, people say Singapore and Hong Kong don't have any natural resources. That's not true. They both have basically natural ports and they're on trading routes, mm. which is a natural resource in and of itself. And so when thinking about sustainable economic development, what matters isn't necessarily the autonomy per se. What matters is having good governance. And what we view is charter cities as a policy tool to achieve good governance in some of these locations. And so what that means is that oftentimes, basically for public choice reasons, it is difficult to have policy reforms at the national level because some groups are going to lose. And even if the net benefit is positive, the groups that lose are often concentrated and are able to fight to prevent those reforms. But by focusing these reforms on greenfield sites that don't have many special interests, you can get much deeper reforms that can first serve serve to uh, attract investment, create jobs, create economic development in that specific geographic area. And then second, to show the rest of the country, hey, these reforms work. This leads to these good economic outcomes and hope that they're adopted more widely. And that's what we saw in China. Uh, Shenzhen was one of four special economic zones that were created in 1980. And then in 84, there were another five or six special economic zones created. In 88, another bunch of special economic zones created. And now, depending on what source you read, some sources have as much as 97% of China's total population is now in some form of special jurisdiction or another. <laughs> wow. okay. And so you don't necessarily have to create all these special jurisdictions. You could adopt them these reforms on the national level, which China also did in terms of labor market reforms and land market reforms, which were pioneered in Shenzhen. But it does show how, one, uh, this set of charter cities reforms can 
serve to make the place where those reforms are implemented much better to attract foreign investment, et cetera. And then two, for that space to then show the rest of the country that these reforms work and to be adopted on a national level. And we, we, we as I mentioned, we believe that this experience, there are some necessary modifications that need to be made. Uh, China, for example, has a lot of state capacity, and many parts in Africa have relatively weak state capacity. So I think in Africa, for example, it's more important to partner with private sector actors that are able to build out the infrastructure. But these broad lessons of zone-based reforms in relatively uninhabited areas to pioneer these, these, these new sets of reforms and making sure that the sets of reforms are on a city scale is broadly applicable, and that's what we're, we're trying to do. So. Shenzhen specifically, um, so there's kind of this tension between, in my mind, between this idea of a you know a country that's still uh, on the political level controlled by the you know communist party on the national level, um, creating these like special zones that have relative freedom. Um, is that like it's a it's a funny it's a funny tension to me that like how how do we navigate this idea of like local zone, small scale, city size, charter city size areas where we allow, where, where a degree of economic and political freedom is allowed, but on the nation state, on the national level, um, is there a, a problem, a potential problem there, which is that, yes, this, the, the nation state might allow for a time tinkering to happen on the, the local city level, but then they might change their mind 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road. Like, what is it that guarantees that Shenzhen will remain Shenzhen or, you know? Uh, nothing. I mean, the, the government can always change their mind. They have the guns. And so if they decide to change their mind, then they can enforce those decisions. And that is one of the risks with charter cities, especially with private sector partners, because you're asking for hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of investment. And you want to make sure that that investment and those returns are protected because otherwise you're not going to get it. And if the government does change it, their mind or has the reasonable possibility of changing their mind, then the project is going to be underinvested. And so, so that, how do you sell investors on, you know, on, so. that, that being said, so there are several protections that can be in place yeah. in, in one, if it's successful, people are less likely to kill successful things. Uh, two, by focusing it in an area that's not politically important, allows for the politics to accept it more deeply than if it threatens their political center. So making sure that it's focused on commerce and not politics. Mm. Uh, we focus on commercial law, on economic freedom for charter cities, not on political freedom, because political freedom tends to be more threatening to uh, authoritarian regimes, and that's that makes it less less sustainable. Two, there are several ways basically to embed that we've begun to think about but haven't really done all of the due diligence yet to think about in terms of collecting uh, protecting the special jurisdiction for a charter city. And so, uh, for example, you could IPO the real estate developer in the host country. And if you IPO the real estate developer in the host country, what happens is all the pension funds buy the realtors, uh, uh, buy, buy the stocks, and then the pension funds will have an incentive when the pension funds tend to be relatively powerful because it's, it's often uh, retired government officials. Mm. Uh, to keep the 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 legal framework for the charter cities in place. Two, if you get investment from sovereign wealth funds in the Middle East, you might be able to do a bilateral treaty between the sovereign wealth funds and the host country to protect the legal um, framework for the charter cities. Three, there is a former, I forget what it's called, but the UN Council, which... Uh, basically managed decolonization and now has been sitting on its hands for 50 years without much to do could be used to administer certain aspects of the charter cities in which case you basically get the legal protection of the un which is the strongest on paper legal protection mm. that's possible for um, making sure that you create a lot of jobs and that you create opportunities such that the people in the host country recognize the value that the charter city is providing. Uh, so even if they don't work there, they've got a cousin who works there or an uncle or a sister's friend or whatever it is that allows them to feel a source of pride from the charter city and understand that this is the best that the country has to offer and not a threat to the political system of the country. Um, 
now you made a point in your your talk here at the Lincoln Network uh, conference that uh, one of the reasons why Shenzhen worked so well is that it is a it, it it took off in the middle of the great Chinese urbanization process. And there's still a lot of room to grow in China. I think the number you said was like 35%, it's 35% urbanized versus the US is like 80% or something. Um, China my, in, in 1980, I believe it was oh, about 35%. Was okay. Currently, I believe it's in the high 50s, but my error margin's like probably plus yeah. or minus 8%. So I'm not There's still some sure. room there though. There, there's still can, urbanization yeah. happening. They've got, on um, the last report I read, which was several years old, is that they've got, I believe, about 200 million new urban residents over the next 25 years. Wow. That's, yeah, that's a, quite a few cities worth. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you have Charter City doing well in a place where there is rapid ongoing urbanization and a need for some kind of regulatory freedom, that there's, there's you know, problems with the regulatory environment. Whereas in the U.S., you already have a high degree of urbanization and our regulatory systems, well, I mean, at libertarianism.org, we spend a lot of time critiquing our regulatory systems, but in the global sense, they're relatively mm -hmm. well uh, they uh, well adjusted. Um, so, does that mean charter cities are kind of by their nature not a thing for the developed world? They're going to happen in the developing world. I think largely yes. There's probably space for a handful in the developed world, but I don't think there, there's much more opportunity in low and middle income countries. Uh, and you touched on those points. So, for example, the upside of uh, a good legal system in a country like Zambia might be currently the per capita income is about $1,600 a year. So a good legal system might have a 20x upside. In the US, if you're very optimistic about how much you can improve the legal system, you're talking about a 2x upside. Um, like Texas versus California. Yeah. Or something and like realistically, my guess is like you're talking about a 30% upside if you get the maybe 50% if you get the optimal legal regulatory structure in the US. Two, if you have a location matters you get the best regulatory legal system in antarctica a lot of people are still not going to move to antarctica you might get a few more but it's you you, you want to be on trade routes you want to have the some economic reason beyond the legal and regulatory system and that is an important economic reason but you need to mold this with a number of other things so focusing on areas that are rapidly urbanizing focusing on areas where there are emerging trade routes uh and so you could have, for example, you might imagine Canada get creating some charter cities because as global warming occurs, you see basically the Canadian Arctic opening up and there will probably be a lot of minerals to be discovered there and a lot of like corn to be grown there or wheat to be grown there. And you will basically have these new trade patterns that emerge as a result of this change of basically locational behavior of humanity and there would be an opportunity to build new cities and if you're building the new cities then you might as well try to create a governance structure that allows them to reach their full potential similarly this isn't exactly a first world country but in russia you'll see something similar with siberia and there will be the opportunity either in southern russia or in um, central asia to create new cities with these good regulatory structures uh, but by and large, if you're in countries that are, right, I mean, Europe, I think most of Western Europe is at below replacement level of births. The U.S. is below replacement level. So the there, there might be space for one or two new cities. But broadly, I think the it's important to focus on where demographics and trade patterns are being most heavily shifted, and that's in emerging markets. Um, now, you mentioned Zambia just now. Um, I, I'd heard about a charter city project in Zambia. Can we update our listeners on the progress of that, what that looks like? Sure. So we were in Zambia last week, which was, what uh, What day is it now? Uh, um, it is a Thursday? Yeah. No, but uh, the, the May 2nd? May 2nd. So, yeah, a week before May 2nd. And we are working with a new city development called Nkwashi. It is about 12 square miles being built for 100,000 residents. It will include a university and a business district. Uh, the first residents move in, I believe, later this year. They've got about 25 kilometers of road paved, electricity. They have a reservoir. reservoir. Um, and so this is a real estate development. It's basically a giant suburb, but mixed use. And they are interested in becoming a charter city because that will make the land more valuable for the real estate developer, as well as the fact that he's Zambian and wants to improve Zambia. And we're working with them and the Zambian government. We met with several government ministries last week, 
to uh, we met also met with them in December. In December, we proposed the initial idea of a charter city, and we came back with a more detailed outline of what a charter city would look like for Zambia. And we plan to go back later this summer to sign memorandums of understanding with the various ministries to work toward create a charter city. Basically, what we're proposing is, look, we will do the work, uh, and we would like you to comment on it occasionally and give us access to your experts. And then two, to uh, when we make the recommendations, look favorably upon them. And then it will probably take about, um, after the MOUs are signed, it will probably take about nine months to get the proposed legislation and proposed administrative changes in front of them. And after that, it will be out of our hands so we can still continue to support it. But ultimately, that depends on the Zambian people and whether they're interested in adopting this uh, framework. So this is an interesting, um, I mean, as you know, it's like, there is some kind of relationship on a on a spectrum maybe between like a neighborhood homeowners association subdivision at the small scale charter city even i mean in america we're used to the idea of states the state level region a region as uh, the kind of laboratory of democracy and experimentation giving i mean functionally that's how federalism works right we set up we have a national government but there's these regions that are given significant autonomy to create their rules with the idea that they would be places that you can experiment, regulatory experimentation, right? Um, to use Brandeis's words. Um, and charter cities kind of fall in between. I mean, like, do you tend to think of them as a scaled up version of a of a subdivision, of a home? What's, what are the distinctions there? No, I, I, I think they're categorically different. Okay. Uh, what I might compare charter cities to is special economic zones. We sometimes describe charter cities as the next generation of special economic zones. So how charter city is different from other types of, from states or homeowners associations is that charter cities operate under a different set of commercial laws from the rest of the government. Okay. So charter Your cities- Your HOA doesn't have different commercial laws yeah. than whatever. Yeah. Charter cities, for example, would have a different form of business registration, different labor law, different mm, tax administration, mm, mm. et cetera. Uh, and so in the US, for example, states operate under national government laws and while charter cities remain part of the national government under the constitution, under treaties, under criminal law, um, the, the quote unquote pure version of a charter city would be a blank slate in commercial law, which would allow them to figure out what the best practices are for this variety of, of laws, financial, uh, public planning, etc., that would then make it a more competitive place to do business. To, to what extent do you see this as a um, evolution or reaction to? I don't know what the right word there is um, to all the the kind of micro state boom of the mid twentieth century. So you have all those like little tiny people would like start their own country on like a old World War II maritime fort, um, that kind of stuff. But overwhelmingly, and they would sell stamps, they would do stuff like that to keep themselves afloat. But then at some point, you know, the local sovereign nation would, would feel alienated and send police. And like, so in that sense, they're trying to both contest political control. I mean, it's like both political regulation and economic regulation. Whereas like a charter city is, is an attempt to say, look, we're, we're not going to worry about the, we're not going to challenge the sovereignty of the host nation. That's, that's up to them to figure out. We're just talking about the kind of economic situation. I mean, do you see a relationship there? Yeah, there is. And there's actually an interesting intellectual history uh, from libertarians basically in the 70s with Operation Atlantis and the Republic of Minerva. Operation Atlantis was in the Caribbean where they basically created a new sandbar above water and then got chased off by a gunboat from Paca, Papa Doc, who was the Haitian dictator at the time. <laughs> and Republic of Minerva, they got chased off by a Tongan gunboat. Similarly, there was a reef and they put enough sand on it so it would be above water at yeah. low and high tide and then they got chased off. And there is a literally a direct intellectual lineage. Patrick Friedman, who founded the Seasteading Institute, was inspired by them and tried to make it a little bit more realistic and a little bit more practical. And I've been, to a certain extent, inspired by Patrick Friedman. Mm -hmm. So there is this this lineage. That being said, uh, looking back at those projects, I think they were insane. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's they were relatively ill thought through, ill conceived, and ill executed. And I'm referring to the Republic of Minerva and Operation Atlantis. It was they were 
Um, they, I don't think they had, even if they were able to found their new countries, I don't think they would have worked because they had this idea that governance is all that matters. And they also, I think, had unrealistic ideas about what governance is. So governance is extremely important. But again, location matters. Uh, there are, are a number of other factors that matter. And then two, they were more in the idea of what I sometimes call um, uh, sort of this, this myth of the Constitution, where if you get the Constitution right, then everything else works out without realizing that the Constitution is kind of important. But for example, if you look at Anglo countries, they've all turned out relatively similarly, even though the U.S. is one of the few that has a written constitution. And the U.S. constitution has led to stronger gun rights and stronger speech rights than in other Anglo countries. But broadly, you see similar general outcomes. Why? Because it's the people that matter, not what they write down. Um, because you can write down anything you want, but unless the people actually believe it and enforce it, it doesn't matter. And so I believe there was a little bit of a naivety in these early projects without realizing that governance is more than just writing down a constitution, but developing these sets of institutions and structures that have decision-making rights over different areas. And then two, focusing on, again, coming back to the location issue, if you're in the middle yeah. of the Pacific, then doesn't matter what regulatory system you have, like nobody's <laughs> going to want to live there. Right, right. And uh, I think Patrick Friedman did learn a lot of lessons from them, but still, I think they didn't have as much emphasis on uh, location as I would have. And he started at the Seasteading Institute believing that no country would consider these sets of reforms to allow for charter cities. And I believe that was a valid assumption at the time. It was founded about 11 years ago. However, in those 11 years since it has become uh, relatively clear that countries are willing to consider these deep sets of policy reforms necessary for charter cities and as a result uh, my understanding is that Patry has been increasingly interested in in charter cities and has realized that this this potential that didn't used to be there is now there um, and I think one other point to stress is while there is this unique intellectual I guess, lineage, what we try to do with the Center for Innovative Governance Research is draw from many different intellectual lineages, including uh, economics, including real estate, including all of these different aspects and bringing them together in a package that allows for successful charter cities to, to be built. I think I buy, I mean, I buy that thinking as a historian for a second, like the idea that to put it simplistically, political freedom evolves out of economic freedom uh, m most of the time throughout history rather than the other way around. So, I mean, some of the, the old school examples of charter cities in a broad sense would be like the Hanseatic League in the Baltic, right? Like what was that, 13th century, um, 14th century? Uh, but there it's this function of this thriving merchant trading class that then ha assumes enough kind of power and like and cultural consensus in the in this set of towns that then they agitate for a set of political freedoms and form this kind of uh, state, the Hanseatic League, a limited yeah. state. Yeah. Right? So if you look at the emergence of modern governments in Europe, I think it's exactly like you describe, yep. where to a certain extent, like the first proto modern governments is uh, Venice and Genoa. And then you have the Dutch, the Hanseatic League, before sort of culminating in the Glorious Revolution, which is the first like semi-modern government. And as you describe, most of this is basically the merchant class gaining enough power to fight the landed aristocracy and take control of the machinations of government. To a certain extent, charter cities can be interpreted as uh, real estate developments becoming sufficiently large to justify internalizing externalities of public administration that are typically thought of for the state level. Uh, that being said, there are, I think, important differences, as previously mentioned, that they're focusing on commercial law, and this is not political, this is right. uh, on these economic reforms. Uh, but there are, looking at the, and, and, and looking at the history of the evolution of different forms of governance, I think to a certain extent can inform charter cities today and also how we think about them moving forward because governance isn't static the, the no. current forms of governance are substantially different from 
50 years ago from 100 years ago. And similarly, the attempts to create uh, new countries 60, 50 years ago in the 70s, um, the people doing them weren't stupid. They, they might look absurd from today, but in the 50s, it probably looked a little crazy, but a lot less crazy than it does today. And thinking how charter cities fit into these uh, different forms of governance and the, the how 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 to create them in a manner that can I think consist of their core attributes, which is creating these commercial legal systems that allow for substantive economic development, which is which is what we care about, is is something that we we spend a lot of time thinking about. I think it's interesting too that a lot of the historical examples we've touched on um, are products of kind of happenstance. So like Singapore, they merged, post decolonization, they merged with Malaysia and then for a variety of political reasons, Malaysia kicked them out. They forced them to be independent. I mean, that's, that's odd, right? That's not, it's great how it worked out, but that that's not, that's it, spe specific situations, probably not replicable, right? But there, that just because by historical accident or political accident, you get these places that end up being these kind of free charter style cities, or at least the inspirations for what we call charter cities. Um, there should be a way we can do that intentionally, not just by accident. Now you mentioned, you wrote a post recently about um, uh, the Center for Innovative Governance Research making charter cities replicable, like an idea of like you're unboxing a charter city. Uh, flesh that out for our listeners a little bit. Sure, so yeah, I think there's, we we what what we want to do is make it such that basically hundreds of charter cities can be built around the world and for example in thinking of silicon valley uh 25 years ago most people would say look you can't like mass produce startups it just doesn't work and then y combinator comes along and basically becomes hmm. like a factory for startups yeah and similarly with Charter cities, what we're thinking about is basically how do we break down each of the constituent elements of charter cities, understand it deeply, and make it able, make sure we can replicate. So there are a number of new city projects being developed around the world right now. Nakwashi, the one we're working with in Zambia, we also visited Tatu City, a 5,000 acre new city development in Nigeria, uh, just north of Nairobi, like 30, 45 minutes north of Nairobi. That is another um, new city development. You have Neom, which is a half trillion trillion with a T. New, it's not a new city; it's a new region development in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Songdo, it might be the most successful master plan city in recent memory in uh, Korea, outside of Incheon. It was a thirty-five billion dollar project. Now, I believe it has about a hundred thousand residents living there. I did some consulting work on a new city development in Kazakhstan, but one of the interesting things about all these new city developments is they're all different. So there's no standardization in terms of land acquisition. It's different in terms of financing. It's different in terms of who you recruit for your C level executives. It's different. So Do you every... take like a modular approach then when you, like when you come to them and say, we're going to help you start your char charter city. Is it like here, Here's when it comes to the issue of where you get the land, where you get the... Yeah, so we haven't gotten to that yet, but what we see is right. everybody's figuring it out on their own. Mm -hmm. I've spoken with multiple real estate developers uh, doing projects in Africa who tell me, yeah, we had these local partners and then they screwed us. It's like, <laughs> yeah. okay. So I've talked to three people who have had this problem. So this means that they're like, right, they're all figuring it out themselves, but what if there was a solution that then everybody could have that would make it easier? Okay, for financing. What if we identified capital streams for early stage financing, for middle stage financing, for late stage financing? Uh, for attracting the anchor tenant, what are the key constraints when we think about what the anchor tenant is and how do we get them to build that initial business that creates a thousand jobs? When we think about uh, choosing a location, how do we think about balancing the different trade-offs of close to population centers to have access to their labor force while still being far away to have relatively low cost land? Mm. When we think about acquiring land, how do we do this? Is it a joint venture? Do we buy it? How do we make sure that we acquire enough land? I introduced uh, the CEO of Nukwashi to a a potential investor, and 
the potential investor said 12 square kilometers was too small. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't say it was too small, but he said it was small. Yeah. So in thinking about that, okay, how do you actually reach the type of scale that can get these types of investors interested? Maybe that's not the right investor anyway. I don't really know, but the fact is there is this demand for these types of projects and by being able to standardize them as much as possible. Of mm. course, not everything will be able to be standardized. Sure. Every country is different. We can have draft, draft legislation, but we will want to make changes depending on the country. Um, depending on the country, it will be different industry. If we have, if there's access to a port, you yeah. probably will want to focus on something like textile manufacturing. If it's a uh, low-income, low-human capital country, if there's no access to a port, maybe you focus a little bit more on the service sector economy because the import-export price are cheaper, but getting a framework within which those decisions can be made and simplified is what we mean when we think about charter cities in a box and trying to empower the various entrepreneurs that we're working with to create these these both legal frameworks as well as infrastructure frameworks that allow for success. Hmm. Um, last thing I'll ask. So I think some of our some of our listeners might be. A- have a touch of the heebie-jeebies when it comes to the idea of planning a city. I mean, some of that's a visceral reaction to the word planning. It makes you think urban planning. Um, how would you assuage concerns like this idea of like, we're going to have experts come in. They're going to, you know, you're going to pre-plan infrastructure, pre-plan roads, pre-plan industry, um, as well as pre-plan commercial law, regulatory structures. Uh, how how do you keep how do you have that aligned with kind of free market uh, invisible hand kind of values so the way i think about it is about a phased approach and scaling okay so for example in zambia what they had they had this land they it was a farm they bought it about 25 years ago the government built a road that cut the travel time down from 2 hours to 30 minutes first they figured out, they thought how can we monetize this okay first let's do sales of large subdivision lots that was successful then they did sales of individual lots and use that to finance the infrastructure build out hmm. so what we think about in basically planning a city is my favorite example is new york they had the commission of 1811 where they basically in manhattan they decided these are the roads we're going to do a grid if it's not a road it's a private space go build on the private spaces that's probably less planning than would be optimal today you probably want a higher degree of planning in terms of uh the infrastructure roads water electricity um but you respond to the market so what we're thinking about is a phased approach so phase one for example might be attracting the anchor tenant that might be a textile manufacturer that might be a university so you get the land you provide the basic infrastructure the roads the water the electricity And you have a deal with that anchor tenant to come in there and build the first factory that employs a thousand people. Then you continuously pay attention to these conversations and figure out, okay, uh, now we need housing. Now we need a small commercial center with a grocery store. Now we need et cetera. And you have a master plan, but it's more of a general recommendation. So it's not saying in 15 years, we're going to build a financial district here. No, it's saying here, right? Like here are the things that we believe are necessary given the uh, basically broader context. And here's an approximate timeline, but understanding that it's going to be constantly updated and constantly subject to change. And so the question of planning, right? Like there's always planning, spontaneous order. It doesn't mean no planning. Um, it means no planning by the state. At least that's one sort of general interpretation of it. And here, what we are thinking about is one, creating a positive feedback mechanism between the developer, the governing body, and the people who live there. And then two, trying to, within that feedback mechanism, create structures that allow for proper planning at the proper scale and at the proper level. So it's not zero planning. It's also not somebody playing sim city yeah Yeah. Yeah. um but making sure that those governance structures are aligned to be responsive to the needs and of the people and and to the market well mark thank you so much for your time really appreciate you coming on the podcast great thank you i enjoyed it our next interview is with ian adams and it involves the future of car insurance when autonomous vehicles become the norm when it crashes who pays for the damages
It's a reminder that while it's easy to get caught up in how cool a new tech is, it's important to think about the practical, real-world effects of that technology on the way we've been doing things. I'm sitting here with Ian Adams, Vice President of Policy for Tech Freedom. Uh, thank you for coming on the podcast, Ian. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Now, I hear uh, that you are very interested in the latest developments in autonomous vehicle technology. So why don't you update our viewers? We, we've talked about driverless car, the, the technical side sure. of that in the developments over the last year. Um, lots of cool stuff happening with the technology from like a regulatory framework. What's the latest kind of news from DC. Well, and it's interesting because of course the uh the regulatory news is far less exciting for folks, but it at this point it may be just as if not more important than some of the technical developments that that we're able to watch on a daily basis. So, um out here in DC last year, we saw a couple of pieces of legislation make it uh, a fair way through the legislative process. You had the Self-Drive Act out of the House, and then you had the AV Start Act out of the Senate. Um, both ultimately failed. Those pieces of legislation had the support of the auto industry, had the support of the tech industry that's developing a lot of these vehicles, and by and large had the support of the insurance industry. So you had many of the forces that are engaged in this space, they were supportive of these measures that would do a couple of things. So they would affirm that the federal government is the preeminent regulatory authority when it comes to the design, safety, and performance of these vehicles, and not the states, because you had some states like California try to get out in front. Um, it increased, they increased the exemption cap when it comes to getting more test vehicles on the road. And then the bills both had a provision whereby new federal regulation would be introduced in this space specific to automated vehicles. And while that sounds bad, it's actually- <laughs> We are it's, a libertarian podcast. I, no, now. <laughs> I understand. It's actually a good thing because you have a real mismatch with current regulation that's inhibiting some of the neat things we'd like to see with these vehicles well, on the road. So there's that tension between, on the one hand, we value federalism, you know, states as laboratories of democracy. Uh, we don't want the federal government preventing innovation on the state level. But on the flip side, some of these, uh, given the expense involved in autonomous vehicle technology, uh, research and investment, having clear lines from the federal government saying, look, we're just going to say, you can innovate across the country. You don't have to do piecemeal. Like Arizona will say, you can test, then something goes wrong, and oh, never mind, you can't test now. Sure. You're getting jerked around. That's rough when you're trying to encourage investment and innovation. It's a real problem. Predictability is a big deal. Um, where you do have regulation, uh, where you have legacy regulation, to the extent that can be as light, as sensible, and as predictable as possible, that is what's going to allow a market to flourish. And so it, when it came to these bills, why they were so important was for exactly the reason you pointed out, was to stop states from doing things that would inhibit the testing and deployment of these vehicles. But they also prevented the states from doing one other thing that they've shown an inclination to do. And that's begin to regulate in areas where they have no competency. So, Paul, when you think about a DMV, what do you think <laughs> about? What are they good at, if anything? I just think, uh, you know, really just innovative, fast moving. <laughs> no, no, I'm joking. I think right. long lines, yep. surly employees, you terrible service. That's right. That's right. So what they do is they, they certify that 15 and a half year olds are minimally competent on our roads. <laughs> minimally. That is yeah. what DMVs do. <laughs> DMVs are not in a position to evaluate this technology. And so what these bills would do is say, states, you don't have the regulatory competency in some of these areas, which I think is actually the case. And so this is one of those rare cases where federal control and federal standard setting actually begins to make some sense. And so those two bills, which ultimately failed, would have done that. Um, so we're left in a bit of a gray area right now. Yeah. Now, is, to what extent is it possible to create like a federal framework, you know, broad, open principles, um, minimal standards, and then say, look, we're, we are going to leave some of this regulation to the state, like some of the more nitty gritty details Absolutely. can be fleshed out on the state level. I mean, is that part of this? this it is. Okay. It is. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad you picked up on that because I would say this is something where we can clearly delineate what the federal government is suited to do and what the states are suited to do. So when it comes to liability, 
when it comes to insurance, when it comes to registration, when it comes to licensing, when it comes to traffic considerations. These are all things that the states are going to continue to do. They have a demonstrated competency in that space. So it's not as though the states are out of the picture entirely. Good. Okay. That, and that, that makes a big difference. Yeah. I mean, I think preserving the federal the, the, the federalist structure um, while still opening the door for, for innovation and investment. Um, Okay, so how did you get into autonomous car, like autonomous car uh, policy? Like, what's your background? What's your Oh my goodness. Well, I mean, I came at it in probably one of the more bizarre ways possible. Uh, I worked in the legislature in Sacramento, okay. where I've uh, lived until very recently, where I located, relocated to Washington, D.C. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and uh, in Sacramento, I worked for a member, a, uh, a minority member there, who was the vice chairman of the Assembly Insurance Committee. And as highly automated vehicles have uh, huge, huge potential ramifications for the insurance industry, uh, bills related to them tended to come my way. Uh, uh, and so yeah. that was my You're reading all those into, bills you got and you it. have to you got figure it. out what the heck they're talking about. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and I mean, it's funny, Paul, because now what? I mean, we're five or six years into this process in a really meaningful way where we're thinking about what sort of framework we want for these vehicles. And while there's been progress in some areas, Areas, and I think the states have actually done a good job in taking the lead here. Uh, and the administrative state in D.C., the Department of Transportation has done a pretty good job. The, the Congress has not really stepped up. So we're in this interesting situation in this Congress where now you have folks that were allied together in support <laughs> of these important pieces of legislation are now taking a step back yeah. because they're concerned about the partisan disposition of the chambers. That's a shame. Yeah. yeah. Well, so... What, what what are the insurance? I, I've actually honestly never thought through the <laughs> the impacts on the insurance industry. Yeah. Um. Uh, so so walk us through that. Like, uh, sure. what are the implications of for the insurance industry of autonomous vehicles? Absolutely. So when you think about auto insurance, mainline auto insurance, uh, individual people are buying it. You got it. You got individual it. cars. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Highly automated vehicles can disrupt that in a number of ways. The first being that when you get to higher levels of automation, you may be moving from an individual ownership model into a fleet model. So that would change the nature of the product entirely, right? But that's not right around the corner. That's sort of further off. What we could see in the very near term is a change in the way that risk is perceived in the context of rates and underwriting. So everything in insurance is about frequency and severity. How often does a loss occur? How bad is that loss? When it comes to highly automated vehicles, when you take the driver out of the equation, the human driver that is, yeah, yeah. Uh, which is the genesis of 94% is the famous statistics uh, statistic of uh, crashes, uh, you tend to change the risk profile of vehicles on the road. And so you're going to see premium go down, is the thought, just because frequency of accidents will go down a great deal. Arguably, severity of accidents will go up just because these vehicles are unbelievably expensive, but the cost curve tends to bend right, down right, over time, time as technology yeah, yeah. you know, is out there for a little while. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, it. we already kind of see this. I mean, when you... When you uh, depending on who your insurer is, when you, they ask you what features your car has, it has. And a lot of those are things like theft prevention, right? right? You get right. a discount on your premium if you have a anti, you know, a, a burglar alarm or sure. whatever on your car, um, which is again, they have to insure not just for, you know, for accidents, also for, you know, crime and theft. So it's kind of a logical extension of the same concept. But I, so Let's fast forward to a day when they're, we're, we're insuring fleets. Yeah. So the, the it's it it only changes in the sense now they're negotiating with fleet owners. Mm -hmm. So whether it's I don't know a big a big company decides to own a fleet and let its all of its its uh, employees that's one of their commuting benefits is they have access to a self driving company owned car. Yeah. Well, they still have to buy insurance, just now the, the, it's a larger unit negotiating with the insurance industry. Yeah. And, and you also have different products, which will come online because okay. personal liability associated with your presence in the vehicle may still be implicated. Or say you have a fleet vehicle and instead of that fleet vehicle going back to a centralized hub, say you 
pay for some subscription service and you're actually able to keep that fleet vehicle on your property or something like that, uh, right. you're going to have to worry about the maintenance of that vehicle. You're going to have to worry yeah. about a tree falling down, all of those sorts of things. So all kinds of novel considerations about the changing profile of that risk. But I would say that we are actually beginning to be confronted with, to your point, about the features on vehicles of today and the way they can save you money. We're running into tension at the state level where insurance tends to be regulated with incumbent systems of regulations that are not allowing consumers to enjoy the benefits of oh, these technologies really? in their rates. Huh. Yeah. So, okay. I'm from California originally. Yeah. California in 1988 decided to have a voter revolt, as it was yeah. called. Tax and, revolt, right? And, and pass... Uh, what was called Proposition 103. Oh, that's earlier. Tax that's a little earlier. earlier. That's yeah, that's Prop 13. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so in Proposition 103, the state adopted, which was backed by plaintiff's attorneys. Let me just be totally <laughs> candid about that. Uh, uh, they, they adopted a system whereby rating factors were set out in a very prescriptive way. Okay. And so you have a number of rating factors that companies have to take into account when they're pricing their insurance. Some of these include like driver experience. Mm. Now, Paul, in the context of a highly automated vehicle, how much does it matter what your driver <laughs> experience is? Yeah, none. That'd none. Like Absolutely. Right. And so you're going to start to see cross-subsidization of individuals where those who have the safer vehicles and represent less risk are paying more mm. for the more expensive people who are also insured. Right. Oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a it's a subtle kind of hidden tax on the Precisely. new technology. Yeah. You got it. Interesting. Um, while we're on the subject of uh, California politics, I just listened to a podcast uh, episode about um, uh, simple tax, uh, like the you pay your taxes, income tax on a postcard, you yeah. know, like a, a clarified, simplified tax code system. And my understanding is they tried it in California. They tried to get it passed and it just came just a little bit short. Sure. Almost, almost had a simplified tax code, uh, tax payment system. Yeah. Were, were you in, in the working for the the assembly at the time or not not at the time okay. but if I, I mean i can't think of a state that is more in need of a simplified <laughs> tax code <laughs> yeah. in california to say yeah. nothing of a um well what's a nice way of putting this a more restrained tax rate uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, than yeah. california so this is interesting because california is a high regulation state in a lot of ways not every way but in a lot of um sectors yes. it's a high regulation high tax state yet it is also a very um it's very innovative Mm -hmm. Right. Like, so you have this interesting juxtaposition, which, which fits to some extent against the, you know, libertarian worldview, which sure. is you're supposed to have low regulation places be the high innovation places. Yes. Why does so much, uh, interesting, everything from various resolutions, uh, the property tax revolt resolution 103 that you're describing, the, the debate over car insurance, uh, the CCPA, yeah. privacy protections, climate change. I mean, California's climate change, uh, or, uh, uh, cap and trade system right why is it such a both on the legislative side and on the economic side such an innovative state that is a question that i think particularly those on the political right or libertarians in california have been grappling with for a long time i would uh you know someone like steve greenhut who's been out there for years in sacramento covering this he's he's got great insights uh you should read his stuff he's commenting on it every okay. week but but I, I would say that California starts with unbelievable natural uh, advantages. I think it, it starts there, but that's not where the analysis ends. I think that California, as a result of investments that were made in the 50s and 60s, when it was probably a little more politically yeah. balanced, has continued to reap the benefits of um, the concentration of population, its uh, proximity to Pacific trade with the the rise of, mm -hmm. of the you know Asia as we know it today, um, the concentration of universities that are top notch, so you can get an educated staff. Uh, it has a lot of things going for it that are difficult to overcome with costly regulation, mm -hmm. and so it doesn't mm -hmm. ring true when you know an advocate goes to the legislature and says. This new regulation that you're proposing is going to really have a stultifying effect on the engine that is California, because in their experience, the whole way through, right. it has not. California has right. continued to prosper. I would say that um, as other states begin to move away from and, and intentionally move away from being really prescriptive in their regulatory approach, you mentioned Arizona. I think Governor Ducey, what he's done is just fantastic. It's providing an alternative. 
Mm -hmm. and you don't need to see the same level of concentration moving forward that you once did to enjoy some of the the benefits that california has to this well, point they, they've i mean i think your point's really well made that i mean there are multiple variables that go into the success of any region or place regulation and, and tax and policy is only one of the one of those factors yeah. right there's exogenous variables um and uh yeah, sure. There are clustering effects, strong network effects that come from you know having these tech hubs, Silicon Valley. Sure, it, it's it's in California time when the regulatory environment is a lot more open and free, and taxes are lower. It's you know, I mean, this is pre Ronald Reagan. This is Ronald Reagan as governor in the '60s right. the time period, right? Um, uh, and those effects are very powerful. So even when the conditions are otherwise hostile, you want to stay close to the hub, right? You don't want to. Of course. To, but I, I, do you think that we're, have, even while you were there in Sacramento, have you started to see some um, out migration of, of the tech industry from Silicon Valley because of California's regulatory regime? I think the, the first place where you're starting to see some of the the regulation, the taxation, the really prescriptive climate be too much has been in the context of just workforce issues. Mm. So the California Supreme Court last year uh, rendered the Dynamex decision, mm. which uh, what it did was it changed the understanding of the state uh, when it comes to defining an independent contractor versus an employee. Okay. Mm -hmm. And in taking mm -hmm. that step, which the legislature is now looking to codify in statute, the state has raised the cost of doing business tremendously. And at the same time, removed a lot of the flexibility that a lot of people in the new economy, as we're right. calling it, where, where you can have multiple gigs, jobs, opportunities at the same time. The Uber drivers and, and Airbnb, whatever. I mean, precisely. Yeah. Um, it is really clamping down on new ways of working. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so what you're beginning to see is a couple of things. Tech firms are finding it's just very expensive to have their workers in the state, but the workers that they do have in the state, they increasingly have less flexibility when it comes to their relationship to them. Yeah. And so for that reason, you are starting to see other states. You hear about the Silicon Slopes in, yeah, in yeah. Utah, right? Yeah. Begin to attract these people. Um, and as you talk about the network effects, this migration pattern and this pull away from California, I believe personally, will only accelerate over time by virtue of the fact that you're going to have other hubs that people are able to go to. Interesting. Well, we're going to hear a panel uh, this afternoon about, you know, uh, wh what's the next Shenzhen, which is China's kind of tech hub. And well, maybe the next Shenzhen isn't in the U.S. It's still in China. I mean, or right. it's some other country. Like, uh, there's no particular reason why America has to remain Absolutely. kind of global tech leader in, in the future. I, I, I will I mean, say I hope that, it does. No, <laughs> right. no. I, I mean, I share your hope. And I spend a lot of time talking to people about the CCPA, talking to people about privacy regulation, talking to people about regulation of digital commerce and um, content. And I have to say that the U.S., in spite of taking steps like the CCPA in, in discrete areas, is probably better positioned than than other jurisdictions, certainly than Europe with the GDPR, yeah. which they are, are, to my mind, struggling with, though I spoke with a European regulator yesterday and they had a different take on that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> um, never mind that the Los Angeles Times literally is no longer accessible there. Yeah. Um, I think it was like a, I heard a third of U major U.S. websites or news sites have cut off access to Europe yeah. entirely just because the cost of compliance. Was well, too. and one funny anecdote that that particular regulator characterized Europe not as a military superpower, but a regulatory superpower. And I was <laughs> just going, is this really something you want to be bragging about? That's remarkable. <laughs> Um, but but then you you mentioned China and of course China they've adopted an approach to privacy and the regulation of the the you know digital horizon that is very interested in localization and defense purposes in a in a really transparent way and so while people definitely want access to the Chinese market we're seeing that. Americans don't even want access to the European market in some cases when the regulatory barriers are so high. So what you'll see is if the United States actually adopts a posture that is more liberal when it comes to online regulation, if it is anchored in addressing discrete harms, which I think is an important step to take, um, then the U.S. will continue to be the magnet just because it will be the, the jurisdiction where people have the most flexibility to innovate. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Almost despite ourselves. <laughs> I, I, mean, know. It's I know. So in spite of our best efforts to blow <laughs> yeah. this one, we have inbuilt advantages that our near peer competitors yeah. do not. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, thank you so much, Ian, for taking time to come on the show. Really appreciate it. So much fun. I'd love to be back. Thanks for listening. Building Tomorrow is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoy Building Tomorrow, please subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.